Um, hello and welcome. We are broadcasting live from the Open Collab at Plymouth State University. And today we've got a program called uh, Slow Interdisciplinarity. And then I actually think that's not really what it's called. Disciplinarity's place. Because remember the pedagogy of patience? That was in there too, which was really nice. Um, so maybe we'll title it at the end after we know exactly what we cover. Uh, but we've got two great presenters today. Professors Abby Good and John Krukeberg are going to be with us. Um, so I'm going to turn it right over to them. Um, we will have a, a presentation and then afterwards there'll probably be lots of time for conversation. Um, we hope folks online will chip in, but I'm probably not going to record that part of the program will stay, um, uh, we'll, we'll shut down um, before we get too much into the discussion. So, and in fairness to uh, Dr. Good here, uh, that was just the title I slapped up for my thing. I wasn't trying to title us. So, sorry about that. It's all good. Um, yeah, and so again, the, the Keurig is broken. I'm sure everyone online is happy to hear that because they were probably you jealous anyway, uh, but please help yourself to tea and whatever else is over there. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start us off and then John's gonna speak and then I'm gonna speak and then we'll open up for a conversation. Um, so first, thank you for being here on this rainy Friday. It's terrible weather out, and, but you love the weather, so there's that, right? <laughs> um, so there's the, the occasion for this conversation um, in part started from this phrase that I started tossing around in the CPLC called slow interdisciplinarity. And the adjective slow actually comes from this book, The Slow Professor, uh, which I think last, yeah, last winter my partner saw it in a bookstore and, and bought it for me because, right, like, slow down. <laughs> um, and I am going to read a few passages from this for you guys towards the end of the presentation to talk about what slowness might mean at this university and in higher ed in general. Um, what, what motivated me to start thinking about interdisciplinarity as an interdisciplinary novice myself, right? Like, I'm English. I do early American lit, environmental writing. I'm an English person. Um, but I taught a course in my first year here now, so that's four years ago, um, called Eating American Literature. Thanks to Liz for the title. <laughs> um, it was a course on literatures of food, agriculture, and environment, and it had the INCO status. Okay, but it was, for all intents and purposes, um, a literature class that integrated some of uh, the ideas and questions of environmental studies and agricultural history. So I was thinking of INCO as interdisciplinarity within the disciplines, right? Like literature, literature majors learning about how interdisciplinarity might look in their field. But the course enrollment was half English majors, half non-majors. And I just went about my business teaching this class and doing my thing. And what I noticed was there was a kind of unspoken uh, divide between the English majors and the non-majors. A uh, part of that had to do with the fact that a lot of the English majors had taken classes with me before, so they kind of knew the deal, they knew my teaching style, they knew how to be successful in an English class with me, and the health, art education, um, adventure education, and ESMP majors were a little bit less certain. They, they was, there was a lot of, well, I'm not an English major, but I'm going to try and analyze this text. Right. Uh, so there was a kind of unspoken divide there. Um, and I remember talking it over with my chair, um, who at the time was Anne McClellan, and she kind of thought, this is a larger question of what does the INCO class do in our curriculum and what is the purpose of the INCO class? Okay, so fast forward a couple of years, we've had these conversations in the INCO task force about um, what it might look like to have an INCAP, right, or an extra disciplinary project-based course that brings together multiple majors. And I decided to pilot an in-cap called American Food Issues last spring. And I remember in conversations with other colleagues, right, this is not eating American literature. This is not an English class. What is this class? Um, and, you know, like most um, classes, right, that, that, that we say are interdisciplinary, we have to look at, like, what kinds of majors enroll in the class. This class, again, half English major. Surprise, surprise, a lot of English majors signed up for a class taught by an English professor, right? So half English majors, half non-English majors. We had psychology, exercise, uh, um, 
exercise and sports physiology, we had environmental science, um, we had, uh, what else did we have? English ed adventure education, um, anthropology, and psychology, I already said. I think there were six fields altogether represented. Um, and as you know, not all English majors are the same. We had English education majors who studied abroad in Japan. We had, um, we had English majors with GIS minors who were previously environmental studies majors, so they brought a different bent. Um, we had English majors who were beekeepers, right? That's different. Um, and so those, like, you've taken classes with me before. I start all of my classes the first week with a primer, where I ask students to write uh, a kind of preliminary definition of, of the topic at hand. So if it's wilderness lit, they write a paper, what is wilderness? And what I like about that is we can refer back to it throughout the semester, we can pull sentences from it, we can analyze it, we can question it, and then the students can kind of see how they're learning throughout the semester. So of course I did a similar thing in this project-based class where I asked students on the second day of class to write about what, what, what is the status of food in America um, and what kind of project might you do in this class. But I added a part two to that, and this is the prompt I added, and specifically in reaction to this eating American literature. Uh, briefly describe your interests and discipline, the methods, content, and dispositions related to your major field of study. I should have said epistemology, right? We're talking about um, And how they might be useful in a class related to food. Keep in mind that we have a mix of majors in this class, so imagine you are explaining your major to someone who has no background in the discipline. And this is something that I don't think that I had a lot of experience in when I was an English major at UVM. I just got more and more specialized. I did more and more solitary work. Um, and that kind of trained me to be an academic. But it wasn't until I went to graduate school and even beyond that I thought about explaining what I do in my field to someone else, that I thought at a kind of meta level about what I do and why, and how that's different from anthropology and from history, and why those differences matter. Um, so, Long story short, we did a chart paper exercise where I asked the students to kind of summarize their papers that they brought into class and contemplate, right, with post-it notes and chart paper, four prompts. How does your discipline field relate to these other disciplines, right? What kinds of similarities do you notice? How might this field be useful for a project related to it? So I'm trying to prompt them to value other disciplines besides their own, right? Um, and if you haven't read Kathleen Fitzpatrick's Generous Thinking, I think this is what she's up to. She's kind of saying, okay, instead of the competitive um, kind of disciplinary frisson that we often experience in academia, what would it be like to be curious about other fields? Um, how could you imagine collaborating with someone in this field to try to spark their imagination about that a little bit more? Um, particularly if they've been taking classes with a lot of the same people and doing the same things in their majors over and over again. This is kind of prompting them to think beyond. Um, what questions do you still have about this field? And here we ran into some interesting, uh, I mean, one question that arose was, we had a communication and media studies major in the class. And so what's the difference between English and communication and media studies? Of course, those fields overlap in meaningful ways, but what's the difference? And we struggled. Right? Really, really struggled with that. And then that led me to think more about, right, like, to what extent are we having, and this is where I'm kind of transitioning to you, uh, to what extent are we having meaningful metacognitive conversations about disciplinarity in our major courses? Or we're preparing our students to have, maybe it's not an ink cap, but at some point, they're eventually, and this is why I have this very exciting, Visual. I don't know if you can see that at home, right? Like, for me as an undergraduate, I got more and more and more and more literary studies, more and more literary studies. But I think at Plymouth State and other schools are trying to open out, right? You get specialized, and then you take that specialization, and you cross pollinate with other other fields, and you collaborate. And we're trying to kind of do that and open out more. Um, so to what extent are we preparing students for that experience in our major classes as they specialize? Are we also providing them with opportunities to talk about what they're doing and why? And John and I talked about this in terms of history and English. I teach a course called Rethinking Early American Literature. And in that class, students have to, they ask, they ask the question, what is American literature at the beginning of the class? Ha ha ha, like trick question, right? Um, <laughs> and a lot of them talk about history. And I come, to, I say, well, why are you in history class then? 
what is it about literature? What's the relation between literature and history? And actually, last year when I taught it, I had one history major in that class. And so we had a really productive conversation about her methodology, her way of reading the text, and how that differed from the English major's methodology. And just rendering visible those kinds of differences and celebrating them and articulating them and preparing students to kind of understand that they're and, and, and understand that what they're what they do in their discipline matters and it's different from what, what other people do in their majors and what, what would it look like to you're getting many hearts from the <laughs> online viewers including <laughs> Kristen Stelmach who is hearting you Hi, Kristen. Yeah. yeah um so I think that's a good moment to transition to what John's talking about which is more about disciplinarity so I'll hand it over to you so uh thank you um and Dr. Good might know more than about what I'm talking about than I do, because I sort of saw this on my calendar, and I said, how did I get <laughs> this on my calendar? And I think it's because when we were at the collab this summer, um, we were asked to put little sticky notes yeah. on the web. And just, just remember you saved his sticky note, and you're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Jess was like, this sticky note so, is worth saving. So, so here's the irony. I was like, oh, I want to know more about this topic. I put the sticky note on it to hear what other people have to say. And here I am, you know, suddenly. We call that volunteering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank you for volunteering and holding me. Uh, so uh, I, I, I put up this this title, uh, Slow Interdisciplinarity and Disciplinary Place. I probably should say in placed in it, but this is what I typed, you know, as I was plugging the computer in a, a moment ago, and I didn't want my first slide to be the first <laughs> slide that everybody's looking at, uh, and I thought it would be good to have our names up there for, you know, everybody to know who we, who we are. Uh, so, um, I, I love um, Dr. Good's uh, article, and if you haven't read her piece on slow interdisciplinary, you absolutely have to, uh, and one of the things that I noticed about it, and there's so much to notice about it, but one of the things I noticed about it that, I, that sort of helped me think about what I might contribute to our discussion today was thinking about how, um, as we just heard, uh, there's a lot of focus on sort of the upper division, the INCO, the INCAP. Um, what does a student bring to, you know, uh, to an upper division class already having been disciplined, you know, already knowing their major? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I thought I'd sort of look at it from a different perspective. What about, what about the student walking into this? Um, and and, and I'll, I'll come back to actually uh, Dr. Good's um, uh, essay uh, in, in a minute. But first, I thought I'd have a little bit of fun experimenting by going down a rabbit hole. Uh, and so you're my, uh, you, don't, you have no choice in this, because I've got the clicker. And I'm hoping that when we come back out of the rabbit hole, you'll say, well, that was worthwhile. Um, but at the risk of, since I've oh, done this hold before, on, I just turned the camera around to myself. Hello. <laughs> um, that's not the rabbit hole he was referring to. <laughs> okay. I don't know how I did that. Sorry. Uh, so uh, so, uh, so uh, th since I've never done this before, I'll just take the risk um, because we are learning about how important it is to embrace the, the risk of failure and whatnot. So the rabbit hole I want to take us down, uh, I think will raise, might raise for you, so many of the questions it raised for me with respect to a first year student's experience on campus. And I think that has a lot of um, breadth in terms of its topic because uh, I, I, I think what does it mean for them to register for classes that have different discipline codes? What does it mean for them to take uh, a tackle analytic problem class that has an IS, interdisciplinary studies yeah. code? What does it mean that they're being told they're going to be having an INCAP at the end, which is interdisciplinary? Um, and when a, a third are undecided or un are still declaring majors, what does it mean when they don't even have a major to be hearing all this language about majors and disciplines uh, and things like that? So um, I wanted to take us first through an exercise that I uh, used to do, that I did with uh, my first year seminar students uh, who were first semester students um, who were wrestling with some of these questions and I decided to sort of bring you into my world see just how terrible a job I did as an instructor, but um, I wanted them to think about what did it mean to, to do disciplinarity. So I'm going to borrow from the Australian and New Zealand Standard Research Classification of 2008, um, their discussions of disciplines. <laughs> so uh, I'm a little bit biased towards humanities and the social sciences, uh, and this one really spoke to me. So over there, down, down under, 
um, they, they don't they have a studies in human society as opposed to thinking about the social sciences. Um, and there's nine groups there. You can see some that we have on our campus, like the political science, social work, sociology. I just want to focus on anthropology for a minute, because when you dig into this classification, not only is anthropology a discipline, um, but so are its five yes. fields, yeah. right? And biological, physical, linguistic. And actually, I know that our cultural anthropology class does treat these different topics on campus. So this is actually you know, a very valid classification system because we use it to implement ourselves within that, that discipline. Um, but if you notice towards the end, it says archaeology is included somewhere else. So mm -hmm. um, archaeology is considered uh, inside the discipline here mm -hmm. in, our, in our country and in our campus. So let's just dig into what a student <coughs> thinking about anthropology, now thinking about archaeology on our campus, might be exploring. So archaeology has even more mm -hmm. subfields mm -hmm. to it. And of course, each one of these members calls themselves a disciplinarian, right? Because I have drill down into my silo so deep that this is why I can actually be classified as something as opposed to just the last one there, which is archaeology, not elsewhere classified. <laughs> <laughs> right? That sounds like my kind of discipline. Oh, yeah. So um, oh. that was New Zealand. Oh. So here's a real wonk of a person interested in archaeology um, uh, who understands that archaeology is under anthropology. Uh, and this is approximately 50 subdisciplines of the subdiscipline of the discipline, which was a subdiscipline of the social sciences. Um, and we can notice, and I, I don't know if I have a pointer here or not, but you look at the archaeological theory, suddenly has its subdisciplines here. And so I think about, you know, what's it like to come out of high school and you're suddenly being, hearing all people talk about interdisciplinarity and all the important disciplines and, oh my goodness, that this is what we had. <laughs> How do you, it's like walking into the library and being told, pick out a good book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I find it a bit dizzying, um, mm -hmm. but I think we're familiar with some of the disciplinary that we, that we saw there. Um, and we probably can make sense of it because we've been disciplined, you know, think about uh, what defines a field and a subfield and, and whatnot. Um, so let's just continue that first year student's perspective who's like, it's told it's time to register for a class. And it's like, I'm going to see what classes they offer from the state. And it says, here's your, here's your list of two classes to choose from. And we see um, art education on top and art history and biochemistry and biology and business administration and chemistry and criminal justice and early childhood education and English. Um, and how do, this is alphabetical, obviously. Um, but how does a student make sense? A first, an entering student being told, well, here's disciplines. This, this feels like the library exercise to me. It's like, wow, here's a long list. And what do they mean? Mm -hmm. um, this is actually what the student sees, right? This is your registration orientation page. Welcome to Plymouth State. Register for your first year. Tackling a wicked problem. English composition. Uh, and then you get your leftovers. So you register for courses, right? And so you click on that button and you search for classes. Uh, and here's how you search for classes. You yeah. don't select your yeah. discipline. Yeah. You don't select the discipline, notice. You select your subject. So now we're actually using alternating lang you know, language for uh, students to think about it. So, okay, I'm going to search through the subject. So um, a lot of students use Google to find a way to search. And this is what Google pulls up. And you'll notice it says for the spring semester, the course number, and it says subject, not discipline. Subject, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And if we opened it up, you know, to see them all, it's going to be listed alphabetically. And so there's no, there's no how do I know what kind of discipline I'm, I'm choosing? Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, this a student who doesn't use Google and actually follows all the rules, and you know how many of them are doing that because they're more computer uh, savvy than I am. So they would, I would follow the rules, right? This is where I would end up. Mm -hmm. But they're using Google search. But here I get to type in the subject I want to study and search for the course that I want to take. So not only am I not being asked about disciplines, but there's no list for me to choose from. I have to come up with it. And so this gets me to think about where, I mean, even before we get to that intro and ACAP, what are we doing to get our students to think about disciplinarity? Mm. Um, and wouldn't it be good if they were thinking about it even before they register when they're in high school, right? And, and what a task that is. Um, and so I think that's a, one of the issues for us to think about in terms of how do we get students to start thinking in more disciplinary uh, ways. Um, so 
Um, here you can start to do some searches. So I did A and look at all the different A's there are. Art, education, science. Exactly. Exactly. So 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 that's so um, I'll, I'll pass these around. I, I think, um, just so you can so th this is just a, a link to go with. Um, so this is uh, so when I you know ask show students some of that stuff, um, show them that, uh, I then show them this list. Now this is from the uh, American Association of University Women. And it's a list of academic fields. And thankfully, it's only two-sided. Uh, and thankfully, also, you can see that they've highlighted uh, them. They've grouped them into some areas. So when I show students this, and, I, and you can see in the natural sciences, which I do have up on screen, um, they, I ask them, well, what do they notice about the groupings here that this organization uh, has done? You might find, you might, how many of you went to see your, your disciplines? Uh, <laughs> um, so, so they're not. So they might do that. But if we just they go, oh, natural sciences, like agriculture, biology, earth science. Uh, and I ask them, well, you know, does this? Do you have? Did you have any experience with this stuff in, in high school, or even in middle school? Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I say, and, and, there's, and I, I, so I choose three: um, psychology, biology, psychology, and art. Mm -hmm. and, and I say, okay, so just think about these broad categories. You know, what are some of the Things that would go into these particular uh, fields. If you were, so if you were going to take one of these classes, what would you expect to sort of study in terms of the approach to the topic and things like that? And where would you put it in your high school or your middle school or even your elementary school curriculum? And they all go, oh, sciences. And I said, well, what about what about an English class? Um, and they go, oh, language arts. Oh, really? What about history? Or maybe you took a civics class? I mean, how many took civics? They all raised their hand. And I said, well, where'd you, where'd you take that? Like, oh, in social, in social science, in social studies. Um, and I said, OK, so if you were going to take a subject, you know, how would it be taught differently between those three in high school? Um, so, um, so the subject that I give them, I, 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 I skipped over this for a second, is like, what would you do with the brain if you were had you had to do it in your natural science class, if you had to do it in your language arts yeah. class, your social science class, your arts class. What do you think would be different? Um, and that gets them to start to realize that there are disciplinary perspectives that they've already been trained to employ mm. um, as they start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you can imagine different things that will pop up with the brain. So I, I put the brain up there um, and jumped to it. Uh, but where I'm coming from is my own uh, intellectual journey, uh, which has been shaped a lot by the, those names that are uh, up on the screen there. And um, Alex, so years ago, um, I was uh, voluntold into the uh, interdisciplinary study. This is a pattern for <laughs> you, John. <laughs> it, it is, but uh, it was my first year here, and uh, the provost said, you need service. Um, and that's where I ended up. It was done differently. Uh, anyway, so uh, so the Interdisciplinary Studies Council uh, was very different than it is today, and the major then was very different than it is today. Um, but I decided that if I was going to really do this job, I better know what the field of Interdisciplinary mm -hmm. Studies is like. Mm -hmm. And I gravitated to Alan Repko, who is has written this um, sort of uh, industry standard uh, textbook. Um, this is a, a recent edition of it, I looked at his earlier ones, and it really resonated for me, perhaps because he goes, approaches interdisciplinary studies after having been trained as a historian, and I'm a historian. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the things that I realized as I started really doing my research is that a few names really resonated for me, and first among them was Julie Thompson Klein, whose mm -hmm. background is actually in, in English, um, but in the 1970s, she was writing the path-breaking uh, literature, uh, and then the Association for Interdisciplinary uh, Studies, which is the current name, uh, was founded by uh, Bill Newell, uh, who himself is, does economics and undergraduate experience in philosophy in the river, and he well, he's passed away. But if you ever met him, he's he's un you'd, un you'd understand <laughs> that uh, you know he, he's he got a very phil deeply philosophical background to, to the issues that he approaches. Um, and more recently, Veronica uh, boxman Sia. Uh, who um, this comes from educational psychology and and just to remind people we are going to post um, a video of this with these slides and then we'll also have links to some of the resources that they're mentioning including Abby's article and some of these books so 
so, so I, I really started to realize my own disciplinary bias as I started reading their works, um, trying to talk about uh, yeah. I I integration. Um, so um, when I do do the exercise, when I did do the exercise for the brain uh, after we went from high school, I said, okay, now in college you might take similar fields. And so I said, how would a biology, a psychologist, and an artist broadly defined um, talk about the brain and get them to think about, well, you know, maybe the artist would use a medium to paint or sculpt, mm -hmm. and maybe the biologist would, you know, want to dissect the brain, and the psychologist would want to ask about emotional reactions and the brain patterns, or look at mice's brains versus human brains. Mm -hmm. So, so, so they sort of get begin to get the idea, um, which I, I credit to Repco to get us get students thinking about disciplinarity early on. Um, so, uh, one of the things, and if we had a lot of time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we might have to do this exercise, but there, one of the things that is really great about Repco's work for me uh, is that he refuses to really take a position. Um, and so he offers in this particular book five different definitions of what a discipline is for interdisciplinarians to think about. Uh, and these are two are, are really kind of pretty basic ones. Um, I didn't want to sit and read, read the screen to you. I did bring these along. There was a part of me that said, um, I could have you do what, what uh, I had other students do. Um, but the other three that I think are really a, a little bit more powerful, and it gets to, into um, words like phenomena and epistemology um, and metacognition. Uh, and you know, it's, it's really about getting students to think. Now, these five are very similar in some ways, and they're different in other ways. Um, and what I did when I taught the Introduction to uh, Disciplinary Studies class, which is now a different first year class that I that I taught. Uh, I had them take this sheet and then I had them integrate the five into their own personal definition of what is a discipline. Um, and yeah, I think you're happy, happy to pass these around. Um, and I think it'd be a fun project if we run out of time at the end we can all team up in groups uh, and, and do that. Uh, but uh, what they what it's good for the, co the collaborative aspect of interdisciplinary studies because you have students with different ideas about, and they see the different perspectives from I mean come to this with different perspectives, um, and then I ask them to integrate it, and which is so important to interdisciplinary studies. So they end up kind of using their own disciplinary bias that they might not be aware of to, to, to practice the art of interdisciplinary by integrating it. Um, and then I would say, what's what's missing from this? And that and that that's a question I might ask more of seniors or of us at the bottom because these are not perfect. Uh, definitions. Uh, but uh, why uh, I'm sort of, uh, I, the answer to this question is no. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, so that was the, here for uh, Robin's uh, telescope people, uh, periscope people, um, there's all five on one screen, so you can screenshot that if you if you don't want to have the handout mailed to you. Um, Just you know, to clarify, we will not be mailing you. Exactly. <laughs> Volunteered. Right. <laughs> like the envelopes. And, uh, um, so, so I mean, I just think the key words of phenomena, epistemology, and communication are so important in terms of the different, the, what characterizes different disciplines. Uh, we all have come to subject matters from different perspectives. That's one of the reasons why I think subject is a wrong term for having students, you know, search for something, um, and and something for us to think about as we try to. Inculcate interdisciplinarity through uh, the curriculum because for me we have to really start with making sure what disciplinarity is before we move move to that. So um, slightly borrowed from Dr. Rebecca Noel's um, inspirational oh, she's right here. on why a history major is and uh, other liberal arts majors are good for the real world um, because we don't all become work at work in the history factory. Um, and you are trained into skills, right? You how to find, how to do research and yeah. find things, how to analyze it, how to synthesize it, and how to present it. And that's really what the dis different disciplines focus on. Well, my subject matter is this, and I look at it from this perspective, and I communicate it in this particular way. So I think getting students to realize that they're going to be asked to do these essentially tasks mm -hmm. that are the same tasks across the board, but they're being asked to do it in different ways is a really important way for us to really kind of jumpstart the interdisciplinary aspect of our general education program by focusing on the disciplinary elements that go into it. Uh, so to borrow wonderful text from uh, Dr. Good's essay, um, right, all of this, right, integrating it through mm -hmm. the curriculum takes time. Like a major, right, interdisciplinary studies uh, should increasingly, uh, should 
become increasingly more complex and take years of practice, right? It needs to be across the undergraduate mm -hmm. experience, not just in our EDAP. Mm -hmm. And not just expecting that people are thinking about disciplines in, because they've taken their sophomore or their junior discipline because, you know, welcome to the major kind of class. Yeah. Um, so a key phrase from the IDS literature uh, that I that, that quoted before, Repco, uh, Boitzman, Sillian, and whatnot, uh, it's really emphasized by Repco, is that interdisciplinary, is this quote, interdisciplinary <laughs> studies is not non-disciplinary. God, we have said that so many times yeah. over the last four years, and it and I, if we had only heard this more mm -hmm. towards the beginning, I think we'd be mm -hmm. in a different place right and, now. And, and I will say that I really, I, I pounded the table with my fist and said this in 2009 when the IDS program made its first major curricular change. And <coughs> people on the curriculum committee, uh, one person asked to make a friendly amendment to the new major, said, can we just retitle the major? non-disciplinary oh, studies. No. And that was the mindset that was there, and that is, and uh, that particular person still on campus. Um, and that <laughs> idea is out there. But you cannot, I mean, that suggests like the watering down of our disciplinarity. Yeah, but, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a, a, a reasonable fear to have. I mean, we don't want to become non-disciplinary on uh, campus. Did you tell me there are no friendly amendments? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a non hat and my daring pool hat on. <laughs> um, but, but this is just such a key phrase. Yeah. And, and, and to invert it, it says, you know, right, we need disciplinary studies yes. to have interdisciplinary studies. Um, now, the other key idea from Repco, and this is, this is a little bit of a, a, a hazardous one, um, is because when I hear the word adequacy, I think of a C. On, on, as a grade, but you, you're, you didn't have a good job in the class, right? And that's not what adequacy means from Repco's perspective of interdisciplinary studies. When do you know that you have enough mastery of your biology degree, your English mm -hmm. literature degree? Is it when you get a master's degree? Mm -hmm. uh, is it when you have your BA? Uh, is it when you have a minor? Um, what makes a minor? 15 credits or these specific classes that actually gave you the skills and dispositions and you know, so if we think about adequacy, yeah, there is a certain adequacy to get a, a minor, a certain adequacy to get a major, a certain adequacy to get a master's, and that obviously expertise uh, to get um, the PhD. Uh, or so, adequacy. Or adequacy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, right? Like, um, so so um, I think it's good to get students start thinking about. You're not, we're not going to ask you to become an expert in every discipline you use in interdisciplinary studies. If you take an ink app, you don't need to be an expert in all these other things. You should have some familiarity with it. Hopefully, you're bringing your what you have gotten dis schooled in, what you've gotten disciplined in over the years, but also that idea, that intellectual curiosity of, of wanting to understand how a different perspective is. Yes. And we in the humanities, and there's a lot of people in the humanities in this, around this table right now, you know, we're very used to the idea of perspective sharing, wearing the shoes of another human being to understand the human experience, right? That how we're into the humanities. Um, that's that's a, such a key uh, a key role. Um, so I think I've gone over my time. Wait, already. can I say one thing about that yeah. though? That I was thinking about as we're thinking about cutting programs. The one of the things I think people sometimes assume is that if you can be interdisciplinary and have adequacy, we were talking about this kind of recently um, with someone, maybe Kate, um, it's true that you can sort of do a lot on, say, an interdisciplinary team with people who are just learning parts of things, but what would happen if, as an institution, like, let's say we lost art history. Let's not say that. <laughs> yeah. Let's say we lost, I, I was going to say business as an example, and I was like, it actually doesn't even work as an example. Um, but let's say we lost, a, you know, a, a, a program because we didn't have, say, a lot of majors, and we thought, oh, but there's lots of things you can do with this by attaching it to other majors and by being adequate in this field um, that would keep it alive in certain ways. But I think you can only have adequacy if you also have expertise, you know? So like, that's why to me, the institution becomes so interesting because it's about the, not just what you do as a scholar. This is why a lot of it comes back to that Fitzgerald book too. Mm -hmm. It's not just what you do as a scholar. It's about the community and how it handles its knowledge, which means we really need pockets of expertise and we need that depth of disciplinarity 
And that carries the ability of like cutting edge interdisciplinary scholars to work on the edges of lots of things. And, and I think that's really a terrific point and emphasizes more of the professor's perspective yes. than, than I'm trying to focus on the uh, more of the first entering student uh, perspective here. I tried to preempt uh, that deep discussion with the, with this slide, but, but, I, but Dr. Is Rosa has a moderator. Saving it. Um, so, oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. so. So, because I think, I mean, I'd love to have that conversation right after we finish up here. Yeah. But I definitely want to kind of get to the end of my time here. So, with my focus on first years and getting them to define disciplinarity, which I think is so important for us, and of course, we as the experts, we want mm -hmm. wanting them to help them define themselves. Um, I was just really struck by uh, Dr. Good's um, essays about, you know, let us be thoughtful about our own disciplinary positions and epistemological assumptions. You have to leave them there. Um, you know, uh, and, and that slow interdisciplinary call for us to be mindful, respectful, and curious about each other's disciplinary perspectives calls for continuous multi-semester efforts. So I really do feel like this disciplinary charge is, is needs to be laid out at the very beginning mm -hmm. of, 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 of the programs mm -hmm. uh, that we are in. Um, and I could even start to envision what a whole new gen ed program, still using habits of mind, could look like if we just kind of be focused on at issues of, of, of interdisciplinary. So to wrap this up, um, I felt like um, my, this work that I presented to you spoke to a sort of a corollary to slow interdisciplinarity. Uh, and, and that corollary is fast. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we need to get students thinking quickly about what disciplinarity means and what it is and how they're going to engage in parts of it and not parts of it. Um, so that they're prepared when they get that to that ACAP and that mm -hmm. ACAP, um, a, a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that we see this as creating metacognitive experiences where they can understand how their major is disciplining them yeah. while also understanding the need to quickly build adequate disciplinary skills or understandings of other disciplinary domains so as to be true interdisciplinarians. I, I want to applaud. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I I'm, I'm just gonna like briefly kind of close and then, then we'll have a conversation. I, I think this person in me wants to analyze disciplining as a yeah. I'm still on adequacy <laughs> too. Yeah. Yeah. Add, add some punishment. Yeah. <laughs> disciplining. Oh. Well, being a discipline. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. revision our whole university oh. run. Discipline and adequacy. <laughs> Sounds great. So I'm just going to end, because um, I think that was a great uh, kind of corollary and, and uh, detailing of, of disciplines and, and how we define them. Um, and I loved Robin's comment, too, about the rigors of the, the disciplines, that breadth and depth coexisting, right? Like that, that seems to me vitally important. I want to read from The Slow Professor. Because um, has any of you ever any of you guys heard of this? Heard no. of it? Haven't read it. Oh yeah. Um, so, and Maggie Berg and, and Barbara Sieber are both English folks. Um, so I have lots of different passages, but there are a few here that I just think are really linked to the the institutional goals around cluster pedagogy um, and the work of the collab, as well as our own teaching. Um, well, first, right, the definition of slowness, and part of me just thinks like we need Carolyn Kinane here, because listen, <laughs> slow professors act with purpose, taking the time for deliberation, reflection, and dialogue, cultivating emotional and intellectual resistance. It is a process whereby everyday life and all its pace and complexity, frission and routine is approached with care and attention an attempt to live in a, the present in a meaningful, sustainable, thoughtful, and pleasurable way. Moving on. That's just unreasonable, don't you? Yeah. Right? Like, more stuff for academics to do. Okay. Um, that's, yeah. No, so I thought, yeah. <laughs> right, like, this, uh, Robin, I think you'll like this one. Um, ideal, my ideal pedagogy strives to defend the local, specific, and particular against the flattening effects of speed. And, um, quoting David Orr in The Nature of Design, Ecology, Culture, and Human Intention. David Orr juxtaposes fast knowledge with that of slow knowledge. Fast knowledge is mostly linear. S slow knowledge is complex and ecological, shaped and calibrated to fit a particular ecological and cultural context. Mm. Okay. And... Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Slowing down is about allowing room for others and otherness. And in that sense, slowing down is an ethical choice. Um, the open-endedness of thinking is connected to an openness to otherness. And this, I think, like, this connects to integration and the INCAP course that I'm sure could connect to other situations. It also resonates with the mission of open pedagogy, which is that you can't always determine the outcomes ahead of time until you meet your students and you know, right, what a work of, that, that they're going to be engaging in in the class. It's also about generous thinking, right? Reading writes, quote, the obligation of community is one to which we are answerable, but to which we cannot supply an answer, as we do not know in advance the nature of our obligations to others obligations that have no origin except in the sheer fact of the existence of otherness. So, right, I mean, what are the ways in which institutional goals can sometimes be at odds with that kind of openness? Um, and then finally, right, slow philosophy overall should not be interpreted as the contrast between slowness and speed slow versus fast, although I really like your fast disciplinary thing, right? Uh, but rather between attention and distraction. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot about the ways in which I, uh, I think we all probably do, but I think about the ways in which I feel distracted at certain moments in my profession and my way of thinking and my scholarship uh, and, and how that might impact my teaching, how it might impact the students, right? Um, I think about the ways in which that distraction right, might also cause students to be distracted or cause a classroom to be distracted. So this is emphasizing attention over distraction. Slowness, in fact, is not so much a question of duration as an ability to distinguish and evaluate with the propensity to cultivate pleasure, knowledge, and quality. Distractedness and fragmentation characterize contemporary academic life we believe that slow ideals restore a sense of community and conviviality, friendship and the joining of forces. Right, like. Wait, Abby, can you say that one point? Distractedness and what characterize academically? Fragmentation. There you go. I don't have to, yeah. Um, so, what are the way, because I, I think this is important for thinking about pedagogy more broadly, right? Like, we're trying always in higher education to do a lot and to fix a lot and to do it quickly and to have a lot, like, have a lot of meetings. And that's important. But in teaching, right, we cannot apply that same kind of fragmentation and franticness to our teaching because it's not effective, right? I mean, pedagogy is deliberate, slow, and it allows for the openness to otherness, to the students, what they're interested in, where they're at. Um, so, I mean, I think that's what I was was getting at when I used the adjective slow, was attention, depth, right? Like in order to really do something and really do it well, um, it, it requires the kind of work that, that John's models here, right? Where you think about, okay, what do we mean when we use the word discipline and how it, does it actually exist within the institutional context? How does it exist within our courses? And that's it. <laughs> so I recommend you guys read this because yes. this is something. And, and, and her article is just terrific. I, you can see how much I loved it. Just all these comments. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's, the thing is, it's not saying anything new. Interdisciplinary studies, right? Has I, I did uh, some research in June about it. The field of interdisciplinary studies has always said, no, disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity are. There's a kind of dynamic interrelationship there. This is a story about my own local context and my relationship with it as I as I've started teaching here. And higher ed innovation, I think, which understands interdisciplinarity really differently than interdisciplinary studies does. So, um, Actually, why don't I, I'm going to go ahead and shut the broadcast, remind people that we will have a resource page up for this. Um, and thank you all for.